Thank you, uh, Dave. Uh, I'd like to talk about stories, uh, and most particularly, I'd like to tell you a story uh, about a matchbox. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a story about a matchbox uh, and a man named George. Now, George uh, was in the Highland Light Infantry Regiment, a regiment based up in Scotland, which I think so goes some way to explaining his very flamboyant uh, trousers. And George was a devoted family man. He lived uh, with his wife, Jean, uh, and his two beautiful daughters in Scotland. Now, at the end of March 1918, uh, George was away from his family. He was on a, a training camp in the north of Scotland. Uh, when he received his orders to go to the French front uh, to fight in the war. And George was a resourceful kind of guy. He knew that his train went through his hometown, but it didn't stop at his hometown, and he needed to get a message uh, to his wife and to his children. So he took a matchbox, and he wrote a note. Uh, and on that note, uh, he sent a message to his wife and to his children, and he put it in the matchbox. And as he was going past his hometown, he threw it from the window in the hope that somebody would find it, and take it to his beloved Jean. Uh, and they did. And the note said this. Dear wife and bairns, now bairns in Scottish is children, dear wife and children, off to France, you know, it's popping down the shops, off to France, <laughs> love you all, uh, daddy. And that was on the 29th of March, uh, 1918. And on the 13th of April, 1918, uh, in the fire and the flames, uh, and the blood of the Battle of Hazel Brook, George died. And so that note was the last words that his family ever heard from George. And for the rest of her life, Jean carried George's picture around with her in this locket. And beside it, facing his picture, was her portrait at the age she was when she died. Stories are all around us. They're the way we make sense of the world. They're the way that we warn each other of danger, share information, enable each other to dream uh, of a better world. Stories are the way we make sense of the things that happen to us. I want to share another story with you, and this one's a mystery. Uh, this is the mystery of the purple sapphire. Uh, and the mystery starts with this man, uh, a wonderful fellow called Peter Tandy. Peter is a curator in the Life Sciences Department at the Natural History Museum, where I also uh, work. Uh, and apart from having magnificent facial hair, he is also uh, a very talented uh, mineralogist. Now, one day, uh, about 40 years ago, uh, a very sprightly Peter was looking through the mineralogy collections in the museum when he found a small box. And when he opened that small box, what he found inside was this, a purple sapphire set in a strange metal clasp with strange symbols uh, around the edge. And with the jewel, he found a note. Do you want to know what the note said? The note said, let he who opens this box first read out this warning and then do what he will with this jewel. If it were me, I would cast it into the sea. And the note went on to say that the jewel was thrice cursed and stained with the blood and dishonor of all those that had owned it. And so Peter did what Peter does. He did his research. We looked into uh, the story uh, behind the jewel, and we found that it had been stolen during the Indian mutiny of 1857 uh, from the temple of Kanpur and was an incredibly famous and significant uh, jewel. And what had happened is that during that mutiny, the jewel was stolen uh, and brought back to the UK by somebody called Colonel W. w. Ferris. Now, what happened to Colonel Ferris is that as soon as the jewel came back to the UK, bad luck started to dog his every step. He suffered ill health, his son fell ill, his fortunes uh, waned. And so he did what any sensible person would do. He sold it on until eventually it came into the possession of this man, Edward Heron Allen. Now, Edward Heron Allen is a true Renaissance man. I want to read to you what it says on the plaque uh, celebrating his life near his home. It says this, his writings encompassed violin making, palmistry, ancient Persian texts, Selzy local history, esoteric fiction, marine zoology, and asparagus. <laughs> this is a man of broad knowledge. And like Colonel Ferris before him, Heron Allen found that as soon as the jewel came into his possession, he was dogged by bad luck uh, and by ill fortune. And so frightened was he that he had the jewel sealed in the box with the note 
He was so terrified that it would bring misfortune on the shoulders of his daughter uh, that he wanted to get rid of the jewel as far away as he could. And so he sent it, uh, as you would, to the Natural History Museum, where we observed his, his note. We, asked, we didn't open the box, and the box stayed there for many years until Peter uh, opened it. Ever since there have been humans, we've been creating storehouses in which to protect and share our stories. From the earliest cave paintings in the Spanish shores of Cantabria through to the Library of Alexandria, which I'm sure all of those of you here will know was part of a much bigger museum of Alexandria, which sadly history has forgotten, to the great cultural institutions of today. We create places that are special and unique uh, in order to communicate those stories. And now, because our lives are lived online, our stories are digital. And so the storehouses that we're creating for our stories are great palaces of memory like this, Europeana, uh, the storehouse that I'm most closely involved in, where you can find 30 million stories like the ones I wanted to share with you uh, today. There is a line, an unbroken line, that takes us through from the great library of Alexandria to the great digital libraries, the great online collections of memory and stories that our generation are building and which we will pass on to the next. So I wanted to finish by sharing one uh, final story. And this is the story of Benjamin Twirl uh, and the foundling tokens. Now, I'd better translate uh, again. A foundling uh, is an abandoned child. And in 1741, a hospital was founded in London for foundling children so that mothers who were going to abandon their children on the streets could leave their children at the doorstep of this hospital. And when they did, when they put their children down on the doorstep of the hospital, they would pin to their chests a, a token. And the token had to be unique. It had to be something precious, something that the child could be identified by because each token represents a promise. And the promise was that one day, that mother, that father, would return and claim that child uh, again. Now, of the many thousands of children that were left at the Foundling Hospital, there were many tragedies, many children that didn't survive, many children who went on never to see their parents again. But I wanted to share the story of one Foundling, Charlie, uh, who on the 11th of February, 1767, uh, was left on the doorstep of the Foundling Hospital uh, with this simple token pinned to his chest, uh, a slim piece of ribbon. And you can see, if you look really closely, that on that piece of ribbon uh, is embroidered a red heart uh, and the letters SC. And they waited uh, for Charlie's mother to come back, and when she didn't, they gave him a new name, uh, which was their habit at the time. They called him Benjamin Twirl, uh, and they prepared him for a new life uh, without parents. They prepared him to be apprenticed out, as most of the foundlings were, at the age of 10, to be sent on uh, to a life of work. But then on the 10th of June uh, in 1775, Benjamin Twell's mother came back, and she presented the other half of the ribbon, which had the other half of the heart, and there it was, unbroken, and she reclaimed her son again. The past isn't really past. The dead aren't really dead. They live on with us in the stories that we tell to each other. They share information with us. They warn us of danger. Uh, they help us to understand uh, the world as it is around us. And the work of museums and libraries, the work of our cultural heritage, isn't to freeze stories, isn't to protect stories. It's enabling our objects to tell us those stories. So the next time you go to a museum, I would ask you not just to look at the objects, but to listen to the stories that those objects have to tell, and then to go out and retell them. Because each time we tell these stories, they become more powerful. There's been a quiet revolution in our museums and libraries across Europe. The job has changed from protecting heritage to opening up heritage, to making it a legacy of stories and knowledge that we can pass on to the next generation as a commons through platforms like Europeana, so that they can, in the words of Chuck Palahniuk, imagine and model the world that they demand to live in. So these stories are our legacy to the future. We are connected past, present, and future. And our stories belong to us all.
Thank you very much.